is has been my intent in looking at the seven seals to try to give you a capsule that would just propel you to want to take each one and dig deeper. But th the more I go, the more I go. <laughs> just, the subject is so huge. And even when I just try to contain it, um, it's just it's just so glorious because it's all about who God is and who they are. And it is a, a subject that is inexhaustible. Inexhaustible. Just like their love is inexhaustible. Just like their mercy is inexhaustible. And so this morning, I just want, I hope to be able to just give you fresh glimpses into God's word through his Holy Spirit to just be refreshed by his word because the Spirit wants to give us a huge blessing this morning as we contemplate these things. I left off at um, the third seal uh, last week, and I just always want to kind of repeat and enlarge um, because, for one thing, we all need it, don't we? Because if any of us were asked to get up front and to explain this, we would never again say, are we going to study the same thing again? <laughs> because it's one thing to know something and it's another thing to share it. And I want you to have ears that hear so that you can share the glorious truths of God's word because the Spirit's going to call on you to do that, to just be able to do it in a very simplistic way. And I want to tell you that we have a seven-year-old in the audience who wants to know God's word better. We have a seven-year-old in the audience who told her daddy last week, the pastor said we should be studying God's word, and I want to know it, and I want to study the third seal. And that puts us all to shame. And so this morning... I want for us to be aware that we need to be like little children, sitting at the feet of Jesus, ready to learn, ready to take more in and, and allowing the Spirit to just make this grand in, in our eyes and in our heart. Daniel 7 and Revelation 4 and 5 tell of a glorious glorious convention that is held because a courtroom is being set up. We looked at um, the ancient of days being present. Now, we know that the Bible tells us that the Father lives in unapproachable light. He has never been seen or will ever be seen by human beings. That's what Jesus tells us about the Father. In order that we can understand how three gods operate so incredibly, we get given pictures. And the picture of the father is the white hair. And the ancient of days is what Daniel tells us that he is called so that we can understand his presence and his part in this fabulous and tremendous story. And then we have someone who looks like the son of man, walking into this convention, and we, we are told that the court is seated because something very important is going to take place. Jesus is found worthy to take the book from the Father. It becomes his book. He also accepts in this a transfer of power happens to where Jesus is now in charge. Wow. And one of the things that is learned, if you are in tune to this story, is the humility, the humility that exists between three glorious eternal beings. Yet you will never find in this story, ever, not one time, one of these eternal beings trying to usurp their authority or go above another. In fact, they're always submitting to and praising 
one another. And it, an incredible example for us. And, and that they set up their family for this reason, so that you and I would have an example now and for all eternity as to how we are to relate to one another, that we are to love others more than we love ourselves. And so we see this incredible transfer of power, and Jesus takes the book and he begins to remove the seals. It happens at this point in time because it's time for the seals to be removed. Another huge part of this story is the understanding of the third member of this family who is invisible. How does an invisible God reveal his ways to us? We get pictures. The Holy Spirit gives us pictures of how the Father has designed for his work to be revealed so that we can understand. It's not that This is what the Holy Spirit looks like. It's a form that he takes on to reveal his work. And it is incredible that Jesus speaks to the Holy Spirit, tells him what his mission is, and then John is invited to come and see the mission. And this mission, these missions start way back beginning in 1798, and they continue some all the way until the sixth seal. It's it's a tremendous story and a tremendous work because God sends the Holy Spirit on four special missions. And we talked about why the faces, you know, please go back if you're just joining us for the first time in the study. Uh, This is actually part number five. The first two are on the book of life, and this is the third part on the seals. Please go back and look. So I I can't repeat everything each time, but I always want to give us a running start to remember and to keep going and enlarge the picture. I left off at seal number three, which is very important for us to understand that in 1844, and we come to that by understanding the timing of Daniel 9, which I don't have time to go into today, but I'm telling you that so that you can make a note to go and look at that the 2300 days. In 1844, that is when Jesus started judging and using the books of record to judge. And he judges everyone alike. And this is one of the most tremendous things about God and who he is, is that he judges everyone the same. Everyone is judged according to what they did with what they knew. If you only knew a thimble full of of God's ways and God's love, and you were willing to submit yourself to that, then God, God looks at that. For you and I, we have a barrel full. We have a lot more to answer to than most people do because we're living here at the end time. This message is for us. Many people in the past have not known and didn't have God's word, but God judges us fairly. Fairly, did we love him and did we love others? by whatever we knew, by whatever the Spirit put in our hearts that this is what right doing is for you. And like I've told you all, I've said this many, many times, but when I was a young girl, five years old, how did I know without knowing the Bible, without knowing the Ten Commandments, that taking money out of my mom's purse was wrong? Because the Holy Spirit told me that. He was working in my heart to say, don't do that, that's wrong. And the Holy Spirit has always done that. And he will always do that because his job is to bring conviction to what wrongdoing is. And so when Jesus judges, he judges fairly. If, if I am asleep and my name comes up for judgment, then he will judge me. Okay, did Letty live up to what she knew was right? Yes. The majority of the time she did, because certainly no book's going to say, yes, she perfectly did. But Letty desired to live by faith. Letty desired to do what is right. So I can give her my righteousness and bring her into the kingdom because she loves the ways of righteousness. She revealed the ways of righteousness. So God is fair regardless of what we know intellectually. And that's one of the things that we need to understand. To be judged intellectually would be that we all need to be Pharisees. 
just knowing intellectually, but not doing, not obeying, and none of it being propelled from a love relationship with God. That's the difference. So understand that up to this point, God is judging the records of those who have died. So this means we have to understand what happens when you die because people are neither in heaven or in hell because the judgment process is ongoing as we speak. So we get to seal number four this morning, which reveals the authority of Jesus. And several things happen when Jesus removes the fourth seal from the book of life. Most of the world does not know Jesus. About 25% of how many billion now? About eight billion people know who Jesus is. And how many out of that 25% know Jesus personally, have a relationship with him? This is why Jesus is going to reveal himself and how he's going to get our attention is through wrath. And that is going to be a process that will shock many people the, the Jesus that most of people know, most people in the church know, is not the Jesus that is going to be revealed when the fourth seal is open. And more so when Jesus says, worship me. Because the first message is powerful. It is abrasive. It is in the face of every person, including you and including me. Fear God and give him glory. For the hour of judgment has come. Why does it say judgment since Jesus has been judging already since 1844? Because there's a transition and an addition. Not just judging those that die, but judging the living also. Because everyone alive will have to be marked with life or death, sheep or goat. While we are alive, remember, there will be people alive when Jesus comes in the clouds. And so he will have to decide if they are given life or if they are given a death sentence. So this is a transition and an addition to judgment. That's why the the message goes out, the hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens the earth, the seas, and all that is in them. A call to worship. And that will involve keeping the Sabbath day. And that will be an affront and abrasive to this planet that already tells God, don't tell me what to do. So if you have your Bibles, open up to um, Revelation chapter 6. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. He tells John, come. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was following close behind him. Now remember, the word Hades translates to the grave meaning there is much death coming. Destruction is coming with the opening of the seal. Death and Hades were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and by wild beasts of the earth. So the Holy Spirit is sent by Jesus on a mission of destruction. And you may not have thought about this before, that the Holy Spirit has power to take life. Just as he has power to give life. Who do you think went down to raise Jesus from the grave at the Father's command, except for the Holy Spirit? 
The Holy Spirit will be sent on a mission of destruction to kill a fourth of the population. And this happens. We've looked at this. There's a whole series, several series on the seven trumpets. When the fourth seal is open, several things happen at the same time. The censer is cast down. And to really fully take this in, it's important to understand the sanctuary service. Jesus is stepping away from the altar of incense, which is corporate intercession, and stepping over to the altar of burnt offering for individual intercession. So um, it's corporately that uh, wall of protection is gone, and Jesus will send the Holy Spirit to pour out the Father's wrath on a planet that is filled with sin and violence and decadence. And so the trumpets will begin sounding. And we know we've, we've, we've read and we've studied about burning hail and asteroid impacts on the earth and in, in an ocean and just um, darkness that will surround the world. All of these things will change life like never before and set up the crisis government that will ultimately lead to everyone making a decision as the devil steps in to take over. These things are just building blocks into that part of the story when the fourth seal is removed. And God has given us many samples in 2020 of how quickly life can change. We need to be paying attention. Things that we never thought would happen, especially in America, have happened. Last week, I, when I was reading one of the little news um, uh, reports, I couldn't believe that what I was reading was actually in America. Somewhere in California, uh, people were being threatened that if they had too many people in their homes for Thanksgiving, that their utilities would be shut off. And I reread it. I'm like, okay, this is in some, it must be in some other country. No, it's in this country. And I said, wow, Lord, thank you for that little blip. And I hardly ever read any news, but I, it caught my attention. And I thought, wow, this is coming. When all of this happens and the call to worship God, when God says worship on the Sabbath and the world in turn decides to worship differently, then those who choose will be persecuted and everything will be taken away in order to control and you and I need to have confidence in the Lord now because trying to get confidence then is not going to happen. Now, for those that don't know God, they're going to meet him and be amazed. There will be very, very few of those that are in the church now that are going to be awakened by that. Right now, the church needs to be preparing by having a, an intimate love relationship with Jesus Christ so that when things happen that we never thought would happen, that we are unmoved, we know that God is in control and that all of this is part of a big picture that God is going to give full control over. Remember, full control is going to be given over to the crisis government and ultimately to Satan as people choose, because we are nearing that appointed time of the end for Jesus to come in the clouds. The thing that we look, we're longing for, unless, of course, this isn't what we're longing for. And then, church, we're in trouble. Because if you're not longing now, just thinking you're going to have a love relationship when God strikes fear into the hearts of people, being fear-driven does not produce a love relationship. It produces an attitude of appeasement, not an attitude of living to please God. So the fourth seal is huge. Jesus will break his silence. The world will know who he is. He will call us all on the carpet and declare that he is sovereign God and you and I will have to decide how we will respond to that call. 
And for those of us that are living by faith every day, desiring to the best of our abilities to do what is right, to be changed, to be vessels of love for the glory of God, these things will be scary because we're flesh, but glorious as well, more on the glory side, more on the joyful side, because we will have a peace. In confidence, there's peace. If you have total confidence in your God, no matter how our human feelings can, you know, we're we're feelings people. We can't help it. That's who we are. We're, We're made with feelings. It's not a bad thing. But we don't live by our feelings. And our feelings will not lead us. We will be standing rock solid on the rock of Jesus Christ. We will be standing in confidence regardless of what is going on around us, the persecution that comes, whatever is taken from us, being thrown in prison, etc., etc. Jesus is warning us now. This should not be a surprise to us unless we are living in darkness. The fourth seal will change life. The fourth seal also brings the promise of an incredible gift, the gift of all gifts. When you think about Christmas and gifts, no, no, this is the gift. I mean the gift of sealing. If you, we live into that time, to be like Jesus is to live in total confidence in the Father without any fear. A gift. We will be given that. We will, be te- we will hear and we will make a decision. We will be tested and God will give us his righteousness. So when we think about the horrific things that are coming, and they will be, you and I will be shaking in our boots to see God's wrath poured out. I mean, of course we will. But we won't be fearful. We won't be terrorized. We won't be living in fear. We won't be propelled by fear. We will see these things as validation of the Bible. Get that this morning. When day one starts, the entire Bible will be validated. You will have You'll be given confidence in God's word because of where you stand with him. It is a glorious thought. So when you think about the fourth seal and all that is coming and all that you know is coming and how life will change overnight, think about the promised gift from the Holy Spirit of imparting us with the perfection of Christ and that will put a song in your heart so the fourth seal just propels life life drastically changes up to now the first three seals we've not have not impacted us these have been going on for a long time the fourth seal comes at the time of the end you know, things happen when they're needed, and it's right on time. And that's the day that we're looking for. We don't know when Jesus is coming yet. But when day one happens, we can all count to 1,335. And that will be so amazing. The next seal, seal number five, is the seal of faith, of faith in Jesus. And this kind of goes along with the things that are going to happen in the fourth seal. There's going to be much destruction. There's going to be a push to take the gospel forth. A, a, a push to reveal the 144,000 will be uh, out telling everyone who Jesus is and trying to uh, preach the gospel and, and be used by God to bring as many in as possible. 
Then, as the gospel stalls, people refuse to love the truth. God sends a delusion so that they will have to make a decision. The appearing of the devil happens. The devil will torture people for five months to, to get them to go along with what he um, wants to do, which is a takeover of the world. God allows him to do that. And then the next, the fifth seal will involve the time that Satan is going to um, is going to take over and where God is going to use his saints to um, use their lives to be able to bring in the last few people. And it's, it's an incredible thing to think about and just know that if you're called to do that, God will give you a martyr's faith the moment that you need it. You need not even think about it or worry about it. You know, right now we have enough on our plate just to do what God's telling us today. So let's, let's not worry about way down there. We might be asleep in the first trumpet, and we don't have to worry about that. Let's just, let's just think about doing what God wants for us to do now, today. So to look at this, um, in order to look at the fifth seal, there's, there's a word that we need to look at. It's called presumption. And it's, it's a place where many Christians are stuck today. And it's arrogant behavior that pushes the limits of what's appropriate. The perfect example that I can think in the Bible is Cain and Abel. Cain was presumptuous that he could bring what he wanted to bring to the Lord as a sacrifice. It, oh, he was willing to bring a sacrifice. It wasn't that he wasn't willing to bring it. But he wasn't willing to live by faith. Living by faith means that we do what God says. We are living under his authority. We are willing to go and to be and to do whatever God requires. We are willing to sacrifice whatever it is that God says. And ultimately, we're, we're willing to be that living sacrifice on the altar. That, that we read about in, in the book of Romans. Be a living sacrifice. Cain chose to bring God a beautiful fruit basket. And that was presumption. It's arrogance to think that we can tell God what to do. It's arrogant to think that we can be a little bit obedient. He was willing to bring a sacrifice after all. But he brought what he wanted. And that is what's going to have to go away during the fifth seal. We are going to have to be willing to worship God according to what he says, not bring him the worship that we want to give him in order to save our lives. That is the difference. Presumption is what you find and at the risk of offending anyone, I don't really want to offend anyone, but presumption goes along with the rapture theory. Because when you think that you are so good, you're going to be rescued out of this mess, that's arrogance. When you think that you're worthy of being rescued out of doing your job, what is our job? We are a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. We are people called to be ambassadors for the kingdom. Why should God remove Christians? Who's going to be left to do the work? It is utterly deceptive, but it's a great, um, it's a great, theo it's great theology for people that don't want to live responsibly and accountably, that we are that we're not going to have to worry about it. We don't have to study. We don't have to know what's going to happen. We don't need to understand. Because you know what? We're good. We're so special and so wonderful, we're not going to have to live through the Great Tribulation. Dangerous ground, it is quicksand. And it is unbiblical. And I hope that each one of us, if we've, if we've been raised that way, 
I was raised with a lot of deception in my life, and it was difficult to do p paradigm shifts, but once you want truth, you're, you're willing to have truth no matter what you have to change because there's nothing like the truth. And we want to live by faith, not presumption. God is not going to remove anyone. He is fitting us with righteousness so that he can use us for his glory. Our purpose is to know God and make him known. To make him known. The problem with the church is the church is lazy today. We don't want to make God known, and we don't even know him. So what purpose? Going to church can't be our purpose. Singing hallelujahs cannot be our purpose. It's not our purpose. Our purpose is to know God. That happens, you and God, by yourself, in your house, being still. This is wonderful, but this is just icing on the cake. You got to have a cake. I hope you're making a cake. Verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Now, it doesn't mean, this is, this is figurative language that we can understand what's going on. And it's much like what happened uh, with Cain and Abel. Remember when, when God said, Cain, where's your brother? And Cain says, how would I know? Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. We know that blood doesn't speak. So what is God saying about the souls under the altar and about uh, Abel's blood is that there, his, the deeds cry out for justice. God sees and justice and vengeance is needed because innocent blood has been slain. Yes, innocent blood has been spilled. And so this is what God is telling, um, dealing with in the fifth seal during the fifth seal of martyrdom, Jesus will send the saints to the front lines. All of the 144,000 and anyone else that he has earmarked for this purpose, we will be willing to lay down our life. And there will be many millions and millions and millions of martyrs to save a handful, a handful of people that are willing. God will use our faith to save others. Isn't that incredible? To have the, that privilege of being used at that capacity in that moment, like Stephen, we will receive a martyr's faith. There will be no fear, only willingness to be used by the Lord. I was asked a question once, well, it seems like so many lives would be lost if there's only a few people going to be gained. Okay, let's, let's look at it this way. Divine blood was spilled. How, for how many? Divine blood, the blood of Jesus was spilled for how many? The majority of the world from the beginning of time? No. So if divine blood can be spilled for some, it'll be a numberless multitude, but compared to how many people have ever existed on the world, it will not be a majority. So in this case, the Lord has already decided how many are going to be used to rescue the last few people because God loves those last few. And he's looking through eternal eyes, not circumstances right now. To also to understand the, this language about uh, the souls under the altar, remember that it was customary for the priests to pour uh, the blood of the sacrifices 
in a container at the base of the altar. And that's the language. Understanding the five essential elements uh, are crucial in really allowing the story to just, whoa, unfold so beautifully. And so when, when they say, how long, Lord? Um, you know, how long is this going to go? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Jesus will give them full assurance, full assurance and encouragement. This, this is a beautiful encouragement for us that if we're called to be used in this way, that we will have the personal and immediate encouragement of Jesus himself. Wow. Our commander will be communicating with us. This will be a time of utter chaos on this planet, but God's people will have total peace. And I, I remind you to remember that if you're at this place, you have been sealed. You have been sealed. You're not going to think the way that you think right now. You're not going to act the way that you act right now. You're not going to talk the way that you talk right now. You will be a totally different person. You will be a little Jesus. And that is so awesome. Can we give a Lord an amen for that? Amen. Wow, Jesus, that is amazing. So the second seal, remember, when the word of God goes out into the world and the Holy Spirit takes the word of God out and there's power given uh, to the word and also to take peace and to kill, well, the culmination of that happens at the fifth seal. The word of God produces that. Remember, Jesus said a time is coming when they will kill you and think they're doing me a service. That is what this is about. So the Holy Spirit accomplishes his mission. The one that started way back then will be accomplished at this time. And I, I am just so very encouraged when I look at these things and I look at God's plan. First of all, God has thought of everything, every detail. He has our best interest in mind. He is transparent in what he is doing. He wants for us to understand his ways. He wants for us to know him intimately. And he wants for us to trust him because his ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. And how do we ever live eternally with a God that is ever expanding and who has more about him that has not been discovered? By faith. Must have faith. That's why God's word says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's all about faith, friends. It's all about having total, non-negotiable faith in God. Being totally confident in his plan and knowing that no matter what horrible thing happens to us or to our family members, because that's going to happen, we're heading into a time of utter chaos. No, it might seem like it already. This is just a precursor to the craziness that is coming. God is allowing us right now to see how quickly things can change, that we live by faith, that we, in spite of whatever is swirling around us, that we prioritize loving God and loving others. Whether we agree with what's going on, whether we agree with the laws and with whatever is happening, that we stay the course, that we do not allow circumstances, situations to deter us from making God our number one priority and learning to love others our second priority. That we learn to live in submission to the Holy Spirit and that we desire in every way possible to do what is right and to please our God. 
we'll continue um, our seal number six next week because there's, there's no way that I can get into that and wrap it up. There is so much going on with the sixth seal and then the seventh seal. Um, I, I hope that you are just allowing the Spirit to take you to a place of awe. You know, that, that is what I desire at every turn is to live in awe of the Lord. And I know that you experience the same thing that I do, is that you are totally undone and that you are just a puddle of tears before the Lord. I just can't help but be a puddle of tears when I sit down and worship him and just, just allow the spirit to undo me. It's the undoing of me. Our Jesus is everything. Because of his willingness, we have a look into who God is and we have something that is so precious and so priceless is to know his heart and that he knows our our heart. Wow. There's nothing better than that. And so in this crazy 2020, as we start rounding out the year and getting to the end of this year, may we have thankful hearts for all the lessons that we have learned. May we have thankful hearts for the many ways that God has revealed himself to us, for the prophetic samples that he's given us, how he's opened our eyes this year. Wow, incredibly so. He desires to prepare us. He is preparing us today for tomorrow, for next week, for next month, and for next year. And if he is one, if he has chosen you to be one of those that will stand to see him in the clouds, then he will empower you to do just that. And dear friends, if your destiny is to sleep, then sleep is great. There's nothing wrong with sleeping in Jesus and just being safe safe in his eternal arms so no matter what his love for us is tremendous no matter what he is worthy he's worthy of our worship may he be the priority of our lives today may we allow nothing to stand in our way May we be careful of the gifts that he gives us, the presence, the gifts, to not take over his presence in our life. May we live for his glorious presence. That's my prayer. Let's pray.